The Lord is our rock and our salvation. Let all the people of God praise him. Amen. Let's remain standing as we sing together our opening hymn, Thine be the glory. Our 
special today is sanctuary. This carol is rose you're going to sing up for us, and it is going to bless your spirit. Thank you. And um, we're really blessed today to, to have Sherry Garman as our accompanist. Um, we, we haven't seen her in a while, so it is a blessing. Lord, we do ask you to prepare each of us to be a sanctuary, a place that holds within it the love of God, the mercies of God, the likeness of God. Help us to be that sanctuary, Lord, that we are a, a safe place that others can come. Find rest and peace. Help us to be that sanctuary, Lord, where when people see how we live our lives, they are drawn closer to you. Lord, prepare each of us to be a sanctuary. This we pray in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So for the last two weeks, since our Easter celebration, we've been talking about stewardship. But for today, and for the next few Sundays as we move toward Pentecost Sunday, which happens on May 23rd this year, 
for these next few Sundays leading up to Pentecost, what I'm going to do is go back to Easter and pick up where we left off and talk about what happened after the tomb was found empty. What I want us to do together is to go over the post-resurrection stories and go through those. We won't be able to get to all of them, but go through them and talk about what Jesus did, where he went, who he talked to, what he talked about, what kinds of places did he go in his resurrected body, and what was he all about. That's what I want us to do throughout this Easter season. Now, depending on how you count them, there are either nine or twelve post-resurrection appearances of Jesus. Times when he appears to one person or more people um, and has a conversation or does something. Nine or twelve of them. Okay, if you're, if you're counting the longer ending of Mark's gospel, you find that there are twelve recorded in the gospels. I don't know if you've ever noticed this about Mark's gospel, which is my favorite gospel, but if you've ever noticed this about Mark's gospel, there's a shorter ending and a longer ending. There's eleven more additional verses. And most biblical scholars will tell you that the shorter ending is where that gospel originally, manuscript originally ended. And those 11 verses were added as the longer ending later to help Mark's gospel to match better with the other gospels. And so most gospels, most scholars don't give a lot of credence to that longer ending. So we're not going to talk about those three stories because two of them are repeats anyway. Um, so we're going to talk about the nine post-resurrection stories. Um... Mark's gospel has zero, Matthew's has two, Luke's has three, John's has four. In Matthew's gospel, there are two post-resurrection stories. First, Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, as she's referred to in this gospel, as they are leaving the empty tomb. And then Jesus appears to the remaining 11 disciples, because remember Judas Iscariot has gone astray at this point, on a mountain near the Sea of Galilee. And that's about as much detail as we get um, in that story. In Luke's gospel, there are three post-resurrection appearances. One where Jesus appears to the two disciples on their way, leaving from Jerusalem and going to Emmaus. He appears to Simon Peter, but that's all we hear about. We don't get any details of that story at all. And then Jesus appears to his 11 remaining disciples, the two who had been to Emmaus and returned to Jerusalem, and some other companions in a room where they're probably eating together. Um, there in Jerusalem. And then in John, we get the most. We get four. First, Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene as she's weeping outside the empty tomb. We all know that story where she mistakes him as the gardener until he speaks her name and she recognizes him. He appears to his disciples in a room where they are locked behind closed doors for fear of the Jews. And Thomas is not with them. And so he appears to them and talks with them and blesses them with his peace, and then a week later, because Thomas wasn't there, he doesn't believe what the guys say, and so a week later he appears to them again, probably in that same room, this time Thomas is present, and he gets to meet the risen Lord. And then, in John's gospel, we get this great story, which is unique to John, uh, where he appears once more to his closest followers on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and they're not catching any fish, and so he helps them catch some fish, and then he brings them ashore, and he catch fishes. He fixes them a fish breakfast, which sounds disgusting to me. <clears throat> but nonetheless, if it was from Jesus, I would eat it. <clears throat> so there we have it, the nine post-resurrection stories. There are a few more times where Jesus is recorded as having appeared to people in his resurrected form, and those are captured in Acts and 1 Corinthians. But for the Gospels, this is it. Nine stories. And what I want to do over the next few Sundays is to dive into some of those. Like I said, we can't get to all of them. Today we're going to start with the story that is uniquely found in Luke. The story about the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. It's one of my favorites. <clears throat> so let's hear that scripture. Now on that same day, this is Easter day. Two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this that you are discussing with one another while you are walking along? They stood still and looked sad. And then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him and said, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know these things that have taken place there in these days? And he said, What things? I love how he plays coy with them. <laughs> they replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who 
was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. And besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. And moreover, some of the women from our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find Jesus' body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said it, but they did not see him. Then Jesus said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us. Because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. And so he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. And then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to one another, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? In that same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and there they found the eleven and the other companions gathered together, and they were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. And then the two told the others what had happened to them on the road, and how Jesus had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. I love that story. Now that story has a whole lot of verses, and it has a whole lot of details. And many, many, many sermons, many messages could be derived from this one story. But for this morning, I just want to talk about one lesson that I feel like is an important lesson to pull from this story. And it is a lesson that has to do with the idea of two disciples and a road to now, we are, I, what I need you to do is sort of get out of your logical mind this morning and get into like a figurative, metaphorical mindset. I'm not talking about the actual road these two disciples traveled from Jerusalem to the village of Emmaus, but a road to Emmaus, sort of this conceptual idea. Because there was a road and a path that these disciples were on before Jesus died. And then there was a road or a path that they walked on after Jesus was raised and after they saw him. And there was this time in between where they're on this road to Emmaus. And so here's the one lesson. At some point in our lives, we have all been on our own Emmaus road. We're going to talk about what that means today, to be on an Emmaus road. And just like Jesus was with those two disciples on their road to Emmaus, he will be with us on our road to Emmaus as well. Okay. So there's this road to Emmaus. Not a literal road, but just a road that any of us could be walking on as disciples of Christ any day in our lives. And for these guys, who were disciples of Jesus, they knew that he was a prophet, mighty in word and deed before God and all the people. And before he was arrested and tried and convicted and murdered. They believed that with all their heart that he was a mighty prophet. They believed that he was the long-awaited Messiah. They had hoped that he was the one who would redeem Israel. They had been his followers in the good times and in the bad times. They had been his students. He had been their rabbi. They had learned about the kingdom of God and who knows what all else at his feet as his pupils. As followers, they had seen him perform many miracles, no doubt, and watched him change many people's lives for the better. And they had great affection for him, deep love for him, and they longed to be with him all the rest of their days and to do whatever God, Jesus called them to do all the rest of their days, whatever he was doing to build the kingdom of God, to tell the good news about the kingdom of God. They wanted to be with him 
doing that all the rest of their days. They had a plan. They were on a road or a path in life, being a follower and disciple of Jesus. It was a road that was full of hope, full of promise. It had a clear sense of direction and purpose. Their lives had meaning. And then everything got turned upside down, right? Jesus is arrested, he's tried, he's crucified, he's buried. And their whole life is turned upside down. Their hope is shattered. All of their hopes and dreams that they had of doing whatever it was Jesus needed them to do, whatever it was Jesus was calling them to do, whatever it was they could do in his footsteps with him, all of that was gone. Now, yes, the women had come back from the tomb and said that the tomb was empty. said they'd seen in the vision of angels who'd said he'd been raised. But those disciples did not believe those women. We find that detail again and again in all the Gospels. But they didn't believe the women. They thought it was an idle tale. And so hopeless and despondent and despairing and with all the steam let out of them, they decide to pack it up and leave Jerusalem and head to Emmaus. There was no reason to stay in Jerusalem. There was no Savior there. There was no hope there. There was no future for them there. Their road had suddenly shifted. They were now on a certain kind of road that we will all find ourselves on at some point in time in our lives, an Emmaus road, a road that is hopeless and without a clear sense of direction, without meaning, without purpose, without a central focus. It's a place, a road where we find ourselves feeling despair and sadness and all kinds of things like that. They were on a road in their lives where they felt flat out lost. And I would say that each one of us has probably been on an Emmaus road like that at some point in our lives. And if we haven't been, I'm sure we will at some point. Amen? I'm with you, sister. <laughs> And thanks for sharing your amazing story with me this morning. We've all been there. Dustin and I have been on that road together before. And when you're on an Emmaus road together, these are some of the things that you experience. When Dustin and I, at one point in our marriage, were on that road, we felt all of that and more. We had gotten married in 2010, and life was good. I had known him since I was 15. It was 20 years later when we got married. Life was so good. We lived our first year of married life and enjoying one another and going and doing things. And then finally, a year and a half or so in, we decided we would start a family. And to our surprise, pretty easily, we got pregnant. And then we had a miscarriage. And then, to our surprise, we got pregnant pretty easily again. Only to find out this time we had a tubal pregnancy and that had to be um, remedied by an injection, a chemical injection. They told us we couldn't try for another six months, so we waited the six months and pretty quickly after that we pregnant again. So excited. Only to find out a week later it was another tubal pregnancy. This time it had to be removed um, via surgery. And then we waited and prayed for a while and determined that at some point we would just either continue on that path or try something different. We tried to, decided to try something different. We went through in vitro and then through all that craziness, had this one perfect fertilized egg, placed it in its home, and found out a week later it didn't take. I distinctly remember the day that I got that call and how I got in my car and I started driving and crying and driving and crying and driving and crying until it got to be sort of dangerous that I was driving. And so I stopped and pulled over and I called my friend Dawn, who had been my counselor through many situations in my life for many years. And I called Dawn and I said, I feel, Dawn, like I was on this rope that I called hope. Hope of starting a family with my new husband. And I had both hands on the rope and I was feeling strong and I was ready to climb to the top of that and see whatever God produced from that. And with each devastating loss, I lost strength in my arms and sort of fell down that rope. And I told him, I said, today I feel like I have just one arm left, and the end of the rope is fraying, and that's all I can grab onto, and I'm just at this place where I need to determine if I'm going to let go of the rope or keep trying to hold on and climb back up. 
that was an Emmaus, that was an Emmaus road, if ever I've experienced one. That's how I imagine these two disciples were feeling. Dustin and I had all this hope, right? We had this plan, this future mapped out. It was all exciting. And so did these disciples. They had their rabbi. They had their other disciple companions. They had their sense of direction and purpose and meaning in their life. And they were headed somewhere, doing something important. And then it all got shattered. The thing is, the, 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 the lesson I want to carry away from this story is that no matter when and where and how much of this stuff we're experiencing on this Emmaus road, whatever that looks like in life for you at any given time, we need to remember that just like Jesus was on the road with them in the midst of their despair and sadness and disillusionment, he is with us in the midst of our sadness and despair. And disillusionment. Just like he walked alongside those two men on their Emmaus road, he walks alongside us on ours as well. When we're on our own road to Emmaus in this life, he will walk with us and listen to us and draw near to us and reveal himself to us and give us a new sense of purpose and direction just as he did with these disciples. He will listen to our confusion and our pain as he did with them. Will sit down at the table with us for some intimate moments of sharing and reveal his plans for us to us, whatever that might look like. And he will restore our hope and give us a new sense of direction. And the thing to remember about the Emmaus Road is whatever your path or your road looked like before your Emmaus moment is not necessarily what it's going to look like after. These guys had a certain plan, and Jesus was with them, and they were all going to be together, they were all going to be doing the work of God, and then he died, and then when he sees them alive, and he goes back, the two guys go back to Jerusalem, and um, they're all together, and Jesus appears to them again, and he says, wait in Jerusalem until you are clothed from on high with power, talking about the Holy Spirit, and later they would be filled with the Holy Spirit. And Jesus has this whole different plan for them. He can't be with them face to face anymore after he ascends, but he can be with them and inside them by his spirit and lead them in a whole new direction with a whole new host of opportunities in front of them. I mean, our Emmaus road was pretty sad and pretty despairing. And then God walked alongside us, and now we have Silas, and it's a whole different sort of life, right? It's a whole different road that we're on. God will do that for each and every one of us, no matter what our Emmaus road looks like. As long as we travel with him, talk with him, share with him, pray with him, as long as we lean on him and try to focus on where he is leading us, we will be okay. So where are you at this present moment? Are you on an Emmaus road? Or do you know someone who is? Do you know someone who's on that kind of road where they're hurting so badly and they need to be assured that the good news is Jesus walks with them and talks with them and will reveal himself to them? And how can you be Jesus for them while they're on that road? How can you be Jesus for them? How can you introduce them to Jesus? How can you warm them up to this idea so that they can then Join together with the Savior and find out what the new path looks like. That's the question before us. I think one of the questions from this story. And I just want to remind you that no matter if you're on that road now, if you find yourself on that road in the future, to take heart. To take heart. Because Christ is with you. Let us pray. Precious Lord, we thank you for this precious story, for all its many wonderful details that are shared only in Luke's gospel. We thank you for the many lessons we might derive from this story. We pray now, Lord, for ourselves if we are on that road, or for those whom we know 
who are on that road. We lift them up to you now, Lord. I'm sure there's certain hope that you are with them. You will guide them. You will once again give their lives meaning and focus and purpose. May it be so, Lord. Our closing hymn today is The Spirit Sends Us Forth to Serve. Would you stand and sing? And come back next Sunday for coffee.